the features of a healthy microbiome speak to the protective capability of a healthy microbiome against uh, metabolic endotoxemia or postprandial endotoxemia. So let's break down what a healthy microbiome looks like. Um, first feature of a healthy microbiome is increased diversity within the microbiome. The more diverse your gut microbiome is, the healthier you are. And in fact, studies show the longer you will live. The diversity in your microbiome will actually dictate longevity because diversity in microbiome is inversely correlated with illness, chronic illness, infection, and so on, right? So that's one key factor. We want to increase the diversity of the microbiome. And after I describe each of these features, we'll go through and say how you actually do these things, right? So we need to keep in mind increased diversity in the microbiome is critical. The second part of it is the presence of strains called keystone strains, right? So these are organisms within the microbiota that um, not only protect the host through a lot of metabolic uh, functions, but also supports and protects the rest of the microbiome. And that's why they're called keystone strains, like a keystone in, in, in the arch of an uh, architectural uh, design. It, it maintains the structure, right? And so the, these keystone strains maintain the structure of the microbiome. So some of those are like Acromantia mucinophila, Fecalobacter prosnitzii, Bifidobacter longum, Rumnococcus. So there's a number of these keystone strains, which are not only critical to the host, but also crit critical to the microbiome. And lots of studies show are directly um, inversely correlated with disease. So Acromantia, for example, if you have high levels of Acromantia, you're protected against everything under metabolic syndrome, right? So uh, out, the more the acromensia is, the more protected you are. Same with Fecalobacter prosnitzii. You have high levels of Fecalobacter prosnitzii. You're protected against all kinds of inflammatory bowel conditions, starting with IBS, Crohn's, colitis, colorectal cancer, and so on. Right. So these are really important species within the gut. These are all anaerobic species. You're not going to find most of them in probiotics. Um, you can't really take them in probiotics because the moment they come out of the body. They're exposed to oxygen within 30 seconds, they die. So they're designed to be in the gut, in an anaerobic environment, and they play a really important role there. Um, then the third feature is the production of certain postbiotics. Uh, things like short chain fatty acids are really critical to the integrity of the lining of the gut, the inflammatory and, and immune response in the gut lining, and also all of the metabolic response in the body. Right now, these keystone strains play a big role in the production of short chain fatty acid, right? But that's another separate thing we should look at as a key feature of a healthy gut. And the last thing is some sort of competitive force within the microbiome to keep opportunistic organisms at low, healthier levels, right? So it is not at all unusual to have pathogens in your gut. We all have pathogens in our gut. It's not at all unusual to have opportunistic organisms in your gut. We all do all over the body and in our gut as well, but it's that diverse, healthy microbiome that keeps them in check. The moment the diverse, healthy microbiome becomes compromised, then they are allowed to proliferate. And when they proliferate, they start uh, initiating metabolic processes that are not good for the host and not good for the barrier structure. So if we just remember that diversity in the microbiome, um, increased growth of keystone species, increased production of things like short chain fatty acids, and then a control mechanism for opportunistic and pathogenic organisms. If you have those four features within your gut microbiome, you've got a healthy gut microbiome and you, you're protected against leaky gut and LPS endotoxemia. And is that last factor, um, I'm sure you've read it, there's a, there's a paper, I think it was 2016, just entitled A Healthy Microbiome, discussing kind of a lot of what you've mentioned there. And I think one of the terms they use was just resistant. Um, and, you know, there's an overlap between a diverse ecosystem is a resistant ecosystem or a resilient one. But this idea of, um, I guess, competitive competition and, as you say, managing some of these potential pathogens or opportunistic organisms. Is that sort of the same concept? And that's exactly right. We, in fact, we call it the resistome and we measure it on one of our tests that we use um, uh, quite a bit because you need to understand the resistance forces within mm. the microbiome because that dictates the stability of the microbiome, right? right? All in all, our achievement of health comes from building resilience within the system.
right? Um, and that's, that's human nature. We, we as a species evolved to the top of the food chain and top of the evolutionary ladder because of our resilience, our ability to adapt in, to different environments and different conditions. One example I give people of that is <clears throat> how humans are really kind of omnivores, right? And we can adapt to different food sources and diets as needed. You know, for example, a lion, as powerful and majestic as a lion is, a lion is an obligate carnivore, right? If there's a drought and the lion's food, the wildebeest or whatever other mammals the lion's chasing and killing and eating is compromised, then the lion will starve to death. The lion can't go, oh, I'm just gonna dig for berries and roots and tubers and eat that instead of a wildebeest, right? The lion's mm -hmm. gonna starve. The same thing with the lion's prey, the wildebeest, if there's a drought and there's no vegetation, the wildebeest can't start hunting rabbits and eating squirrels and worms and so on. It's gonna starve to death, right? But the human in that condition, if it doesn't have a mammal to eat, if it doesn't have uh, you know, adequate uh, vegetation to eat, it can, humans will dig for roots and tubers. It can eat insects. We can eat berries and fruits and all kinds of different things to survive and make it through. We've got human, uh, humans like the Inuit Indians that survive on 90 plus percent of fat in their diet, right? Now, if any of us went to and started eating their diet, we'd probably kill us, but they've got this evolutionary adaptation to being able to live in that region, in that freezing cold region and eat fat as a, as a largest part of their diet. And so, you know, we've, we have this resilience and that's what I always dictate to people as like, if you wanna truly be healthy, you have to have resilience. What, what makes me cringe a little bit is when people say, oh no, I'm, totally healthy as long as I don't eat this, 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 and this, right. or do this, 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 and this, right? <laughs> it lists like 15 things they can't do, eat, or, or experience. So that's not health. That means your, your, your microbiome and your system is very tenuous, and it, it won't take much to throw it into disarray. Mm. So how, uh, I guess, moving into this idea, we've got these four variables. Um, what are some of the things that are within our control that we can I guess, utilize to modify these four variables? Yeah, so let's start with the diversity piece. Um, one of the key ways of increasing the diversity within your microbiome is to increase the diversity of your diet, right? So the more diverse your diet is, the more different types of foods you consume, the more diverse your microbiome is. Your micro, your, most of what you eat actually goes to feed your microbiome, right? We digest and assimilate a very small proportion of the food that we eat, most of it, think of it as feeding your ecosystem on the inside. Um, and, and that's a big diversity in plant-based foods, diversity in animal-based foods, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, resistant starches. So just trying nuts and seeds. So trying to get a nice little diversity within your system. And again, that's kind of how we evolved, right? Humans did not, through the course of evolution, have the luxury of saying, I'm going to be vegan, or I'm going to be carnivore, or I'm going to be paleo, right? Um, they, they, we just had to eat what was available uh, and we had to eat what we could find. And that was a big diversity uh, in, in, um, in food sources. Some anthropological studies assume that or, or estimate that our ancestors consumed upwards of 600 different types of foods annually. You take an average Westerner and may eat about 15, 16 different types of foods, right? So increasing the diversity in our, in our diet is huge. Uh, one simple way I always tell people to do is that, you know, we all kind of have our habits of where we shop for our food and so on. Um, you know, if you go once a week to uh, an ethnic grocery store, for example, um, in, in my region, we have this, this store called the H Mart, which is an amazing Asian market um, that has, you know, vegetables and meats and fruits that we would never see at our Whole Foods and the regular grocery stores that we go to. And, and you just select one thing from that grocery store, whether it's a, a root, a tuber, a vegetable, a cabbage of some sort, and then incorporate that into your diet for that week. You don't have to make a whole meal out of it. You can just chop it up, steam it, saute it, whatever it may be, uh, just add it into your diet. And if each week you add one new thing into your diet and you try to maintain the exposure to those things, you're going to increase the diversity in your diet quite dramatically. So that's, uh, that's one thing you could do. The second thing is it's counterintuitive, but not feeding the microbiome, right? So a period of fasting actually dramatically can increase diversity within the microbiome. Your, microbi your microbes within your microbiome are layered into different types of fermenters. You've got 
primary, secondary, tertiary fermenters that do their job at different times during the day and do their jobs during different parts of the metabolic cycle. So when you first bring in food into your system, all of those large macromolecules are gonna be attacked by the primary fermenters, right? And the primary fermenters are gonna then digest those and produce secondary metabolites that then feed a whole slew of secondary uh, digesters or fermenters. And then they're gonna produce metabolites that feeds another layer of microbes, right? And so that whole process of this cascading of feeding microbes uh, where they feed each other, it's called cross-feeding within the microbiome, that takes long periods of time. From one meal, it could be 10 hours before the third layer of microbes are actually getting what they need in order to create the metabolic activity. And so if we constantly keep adding food into the system, then it triggers and selects for the primary fermenters for the most part. And then these guys down here at the base hardly get to, in, to actuate their metabolic activity, which means they don't get as much growth. They don't get as much representation, as much time to multiply and have their, their uh, representation within the population, right? So a period of fasting to allow all of this cascade of microbes to go through their metabolic process can be very important. I myself do a daily intermittent fast. I do about a 16 hour fast almost every day uh, where I stop eating at some point in the evening, eight, nine o'clock. Then I don't eat my next meal till around noon or one o'clock the next day. So I kind of, I put most of that during the nighttime sleeping time. Um, and then I've just kind of skipped the breakfast and not, not make my first meal till lunchtime or, or late lunch. So not, so feeding a diverse uh, rich diet and then not feeding the microbiome, both of those things are important as well. Another way of increasing diversity is by getting outside. Um, it is pretty clear in the research that the more contact you have with the natural environment, and I don't mean outside as in just walking up and down the sidewalk in your street, right? Um, the more you can go to natural environments, whether it's you know, in our area, forest preserves, where you can go by a lake or you walk through, uh, you know, path on, uh, on, on the forest preserve, those kind of interactions dramatically increase the diversity in your microbiome because you'll pick up organisms from the environment and those organisms from the environment will actually stimulate the growth of some of the uh, endogenous species within your gut microbiome as well, as well. Another thing is to reduce exposure of things that are hurting your microbiome, right? So, when it comes to food, trying to go organic as much as you can so you get less exposure to things like pesticides and herbicides, which are known to be antibiotics in your gut, which bring down diversity quite dramatically. We did a study with King's College uh, a couple of years ago where we showed that as little as three weeks of exposure to environmentally safe levels of Roundup uh, reduced diversity in the microbiome very dramatically. And so imagine if you're getting that exposure every single day through foods that you're eating, it acts as a long-term antibiotic within your microbiome and shrinks your diversity over time quite dramatically, right? So the more you can go to its cleaner food, if you can build, if you can grow a little bit of your produce in your own garden, that helps a lot because that's a cleaner source of produce. Uh, the more you can eat less processed foods because processed foods will have preservatives, antimicrobials, and all that in there to, to pr provide shelf life, right? So the more you can reduce those things, and again, I don't want people to feel overwhelmed like they have to make these big radical changes. It's small changes over time consistently will create profound effects, right? So on the diverse food side I mentioned, just add one thing a week into your diet. On the fasting side, even if you can do two, three days of an intermittent fasting a week to start, that's great. If you can get outside once a week, if you can use it like a prescription, meaning you know you prescribe.